today we are going to talk about uh, this whole concept about open primaries or political system and how it works. Uh, I've been involved in this issue for a number of years, but let me just do a short brief introduction. So I used to be a city council person and mayor in the city of Phoenix. I was mayor from about 1989 to 1995. Um, and when I first ran, I remember my uh, my father used to introduce me. He was a, he's a rancher up in Prescott. He always would say that I was involved in politics, and he defined that as Holly means many ticks means blood sucking leeches. You saw me as a tick, but in any event, the uh, um, I love local government. I love my involvement with it. I love the city of Phoenix. I love the state of Arizona. Um, when I first ran, I ran in the district. It's a three to one Republican district. Today I'm an independent, but at the time I was a registered Democrat, I think I was 24 years old. There was no good reason for me to leave. I was not only way out down with money, uh, I was also way out down candidly with talent and somebody who was uh, much more prepared to hold the job than I was. But I worked. I knocked on 80,000 doors. It took me about six months to do it. Now, any of you who are elected officials in here in a nonpartisan system, you know how you know how to schools. You get a list, right? Democrats, Republicans, independents, usually high advocacy voters, and then you go knock on their door and you talk to them about your campaign. When you do that at look at the local level, you begin to get input back from people. Now the input that I gave back from people, I speak to Republicans who oftentimes will talk to me about business or economics. I talk to Democrats who might talk to me about schools or local park or issues that they were concerned about. It wasn't all that difficult to begin to create a connection between the two. To recognize that the social programs that we care about are tied to economic development, tied to business, tied to the success of both. Now, a little later, I ran for uh, governor. I had to run in a partisan primary. If any of you have ever had to do that, my condolences to you. Um, but I can tell you in a partisan primary, Everything changed. First, they had me go right as a plan in terms of what I would do for the state. I remember getting my pollster looking through this and saying, Oh my gosh, you won't win dog catcher in a Democratic primary. This is you know, it worked really well in a nonpartisan race, but in a partisan race, it just wasn't ideological enough. And here's the numbers. These are the numbers when you run in a partisan primary. About seventy percent of all Americans are registered to vote. Of that seventy percent, somewhere around thirty-five percent are Democrat, thirty-five percent are independents. Right? So times the thirty-five percent by the seventy percent, you get about twenty percent of the voters in either primary. Forty-four percent of all Americans are independents. Those folks you don't really count because they can't run in the primary. But then the turnout ends up being about thirty percent. So you're talking about 6% of everyone you know who voted a Democratic primary or a Republican primary. And they tend to become more ideologically distilled. Now, here's the way you win that. You run as hard as you can towards your extreme, and then when you're done, you try to make sure that they think that the other guy's worse than you. That's how you win that race. Right? They call it pivoting, but that's really what it's all about. We've created an environment that we have nationally today where there are huge divisions and where everything has become binary. Everything's become binary. You are either uh, pro-business or you're pro-labor. As if you could possibly be pro-labor without being pro-business. You're either pro-business or you're pro-education. As if you could possibly be pro-business without being pro-education. You're either pro-God or you're pro-human rights. As if, you could, as if there's some God in the universe who isn't pro-human rights. The point is this. In local government, you have the ability to pull people together. And part of that isn't just you. It's that you operate in a system that rewards that. The system that we have today, at the state level and at the federal level, does not reward that. If you look at what happens in Congress, there are 435 congressional districts. Only 35 of them are competitive. What that means is that you win the Republican primary or the Democratic primary, you never even have to talk to the other voters. You don't have to learn how to listen to them. You don't have to take into account the things that they say. I'm 100% sure because I have incredible faith in local government. 
But here's why. I know you listen to both sides. You don't have a choice. It's the type of system that you run in. We've created a system for my biggest concern is that people are losing faith. They're losing faith in whether or not we can really make our own work. Now, I have a podcast I call it The Optimistic American. And people say, well, how can you be optimistic? And here's what I always tell them. Maybe you need to be optimistic. If you want to see that you know, the government can still do great things, go check out a local firehouse or a police station or a local school. You'll be amazed what it is that we can do and that we are doing. But they're not hearing that message. They're hearing a message about despair because one side has to convince the public that the other side is just simply worse. Now, there are lots of different systems that we can talk about. We can talk about the right towards voting and whatnot, but Heather is nice. And Heather, just as Representative Carter, has done a great job. She was the, the person in the legislature that if you wanted to go to someone who would listen, she was the person that you would pick because she would listen to all sides. She would try to come up with a balanced decision. It served her well in governing, they didn't serve her so well in her primary. Nonetheless, Representative Carter. Well, thank you. That's one heck of an introduction. I appreciate that. So good afternoon. I hope you're having a wonderful conference. So great to see everyone here today. Paul, you did an excellent job laying out the problem that we're facing in this country when it comes to partisan primaries. And even just getting on the ballot becomes a hurdle. So if you look at the slides, you can see that the number of signatures that is required to get different candidates on the ballot are different based upon what party you belong to. And we've created an artificial barrier, definitely for independent candidates to get on the ballot. So it's not just really who we elect in terms of the challenges we're facing in this country, but how we elect people. So what happens is, as Paul described, is when you go down to the Capitol and you're trying to get the order of people, sometimes you have to work with people in the other party. I like to say the majority of the time you need to work with anybody that's willing to pull up their space and get the work done. But what happens is we have this dump, we have this two-party system, and you get reduced to the lowest common denominator and the party purity test on either side. So if you challenge your party in the process of trying to govern, you will be fired. You are threatened with that. You will see examples of that. And I, unfortunately, was faced with that challenge in 2020. And so I always like to say the work that you do at the Capitol is the same coin, right? On one side of the coin, you have your political work. On the opposite side of the coin, you have your policy work. You have to be able to live in both worlds. In fact, like Paul, we talked about originally learning, you used to be able to go door to door to door and really talk to the people that you represent. A lot of people don't know this. In Arizona, our legislative districts are as large as some states' congressional districts. When I was first elected, my population that I represented was 235,000 people. And so how do you get elected? Well, you run a partisan primary. So, for example, if you live in a district that is primarily Republican registration voter dominated, or in a district that is primarily more Democrat uh, registered voters, or a district that's competitive, it's going to determine where you get elected. I'm going to walk through a little exercise with you as in up. So everybody just stand up real quick. Do this little exercise. And let's pretend that this room represents 235,000 people in my former legislative district, which was legislative district. Right off the bat, more than half of the room is going to need to sit down. So please, this side of the room, just completely sit down. And you're sitting down for a number of reasons. Number one, you might be registered as a, a Democratic voter. You might be registered, you might not be registered to vote, right? I was like, have that conversation with the high school with my kids. Like, why do people not register to vote? And then I heard about the stories that are very, very interesting. But long story short, you might not be registered to vote. So now we have another half of the room, which are Republicans and independents. This is a slim estimate. But unfortunately, what happens is that the majority of the independents do not show up in a primary. In Arizona, we actually have open primaries. So you think that they've done they vote, right? But they have to take an extra step and request a ballot. So the back quarter of 
the world is not by the species down. So let's say you are, um, I'm going to say all the way up to you, Chef, all the way up to Chef. We're going to have everybody sit down. Those, now everybody that's seated represents the Mammoth County, the Border Registration, the Mammoth County, in the district. And typically you'll see anywhere between, are you ready for this? Drum roll. Five to eight, maximum 10% of the independents voting in a Republican primary. So I'm going to bring two of you, uh, with the red dress and your neighbor, with the, with the big yep. You guys stand and pretend you're running uh, independent voters who have decided to pick a Republican primary ballot in this election. The rest will represent the Republicans in the room. Now, in the primary, only 35% of the people show up, so a third of you sit down. I'll, keep, I'll have you guys sit down. Uh, the first three people stay standing, and the rest sit down. Now, these five people will decide who represents this legislative district because it is almost statistically impossible for anybody other than a party affiliated candidate to win in a general election. These five people will determine what do we do about taxes? What do we do about education? How do we solve the water crisis in Arizona? What do we do about transportation? How do we run our government? How do we run our elections? Now, these five people, who happen to be the ones that showed up in a Republican primary to vote, have an extreme opinion about these issues. Who do you think the elected official is going to listen to? Those who are seated or those who are standing? That's a rhetorical question, but everybody yell at the end. Seated or standing? Standing. Standing. And my favorite thing, last comment, and you can sit down. My last comment is I would get emails, tons of emails from people going, I can't believe you voted this way, and, I, and I'm never going to vote for you again. Just so you know, your voting record is public record. And so it's very easy to look somebody up on the voter database to see if they voted. Nine times out of ten, they did not vote in the Republican primary. And I go, okay, well, I guess it's a chance to go to Maybe you might be a Republican primary ballot. You might participate in this next election. So these five people have an enormous, outsized, I would argue, power compared to the room. So thank you. Big round of applause. So this is really challenging because what we've seen nationally, Paul, and we look good at this, is it's getting more partisan. The, the, the drift to these hyper extremes on either the right or the left has become so extreme that look at the list of people who were primary in this last election. Now, if you know any of them, you know that you're looking at a list. I'm just going to do a shout out to Speaker Bowers. Now, a couple of years ago, and definitely decades ago, you wouldn't even imagine challenging a sitting speaker of a chamber who has really done a tremendous work. Now, I not always agree with, with, uh, with Rusty. Rusty and I have had spirited debates about issues. But one thing I can always trust is Rusty would take the time, study the issues, get the facts, and make a principal decision. Guess what? He was primary, and he lost his primary. So look at this list up here. This is quite an impressive list. And you notice it cuts both ways. It cuts on the right side of the aisle, and it cuts on the left side of the aisle. So this gets back to this conversation that we need to have as a community and as a state. How do we want to decide who represents us at the state level? And what is the best process for us to get the Arizona that we think we want and we deserve and we need to solve some of the most important problems that we're facing as a state? So post primary, we've got some other election results up there. And if you think about it, unfortunately, the top offices, these are statewide offices where one on the Republican side was with less than 10% of all of the registered voters. So that is such a small fraction. It's back to the five people we had left standing in the room. And you can see, though, that we've got some very um, extreme views, for lack of a better term, on, on the right side of the aisle. And so the challenge will be what's going to happen in the general election. And when you talk to voters who show up to vote in the general election, which is historically a higher voter turnout, we're like, is this the best we can get in terms of voting? 
I want a third option. Well, there is no third option because the process doesn't allow for that, and the process rewards the extreme on either side of the party. So this is this is where we are at in Arizona. Those are our results. I'm going to hand it over to Blake now to say um, share some solutions that are working across the country. Any comments? Thank you, uh, Heather, and thank you to everyone for inviting us to be here uh, with you today. It's my pleasure to talk to you. My name is Blake Sockdown. I'm the president of our local nonprofit working on the election system for Florida Choice, Arizona. Uh, I'm an engineer. Uh, I've spent 28 years working for uh, Intel. I've been retired for uh, a few years now, and somebody distinctively invited me to get involved in local politics. <laughs> And probably even more mistakenly, I accept it. Um, but after about eight, seven years or so of being involved in um, politics, uh, I ran for state legislature, among other things. Um, I looked back at my work at Intel and the systems thinking training that I got. And the conclusion that I came to is bad systems beat good people. But nobody goes into politics intending to be rude or intending to poorly serve their constituents. I believe people go into politics for good reasons, and the system forces them to do bad things. And so as a good engineer, I said, well, okay, um, then I must educate myself on the system and go to work on fixing the system. And so I've been involved Choice in Arizona, um, and it's my privilege now this afternoon to talk to you a little bit about ranked choice voting. I'm going to start off with asking you a question by show of hands. Um, how many of you have gone into a grocery store or an ice cream shop and chosen a flavor of ice cream? Almost unanimously, um, you've experienced ranked choice voting. You evaluated your choices, you exercised your, you evaluated your options, you exercised your judgment, and you made a choice. That's my choice voting. And so what we're suggesting is that you take those skills and capabilities and apply them to helping to improve our election system. And so I'm going to talk to you just a little bit about how that works. Ranked choice voting uh, is a system that ensures that the, major, the winner has a majority of the vote. So we're going to look at an example election where we have four candidates. You get a ballot that looks remarkably like the ballot that you get today, except the little ovals next to the candidate's name allow you to indicate your first, second, third, and fourth choice. Those ballots are tabulated using the same equipment and methods that we tabulate our election results today. And those first choice ballot votes are tabulated. And in this case, we have an election where we tabulate the first choice votes, and the orange candidate gets 55% of the vote. So they're elected on the first choice votes. Right, they got more than 50% of the vote, they're elected. There's no need for any further ranked choice voting. If, however, we have an election that looks like this, um, where the leading candidate has only 40% of the vote, so less than 50% of the vote, we would proceed with the rounds of ranked choice voting. And the way that works is that we we identify a candidate who got the least number of votes, and we transfer their votes to their second choice. And you can see how that works here. Um, and we look now after the second round, uh, and we see that although those votes transfer, we still don't have a candidate with more than 50% of the vote. So we proceed with the third round of ranked choice voting. We again identify and eliminate the candidate with the least number of votes, in this case, the green candidate. 
and we transfer their votes to their next choice. So now, after the third round, the purple candidate has more than 50% of the vote, and they are the winner of this election. Ranked choice voting ensures that the candidate who wins has more than 50% of the vote. Um, when we look at this screen, there are a couple of other things I want to point out about ranked choice voting. If you're a fan of the Peach candidate, in the couple of weeks leading up to the election, one of the things that you're likely to hear is, don't waste your vote. They can't win. Anybody heard that about the candidate that they, they think they support? Ranked choice voting eliminates the concern about wasting votes. If you're a fan of the Peach candidate, vote for the Peach candidate as your first choice, and then select the second choice. If the Peach candidate is eliminated, your vote transfers to your second choice, and your vote still counts. Ranked choice voting also eliminates or reduces negative campaigning. So if you're a candidate and you're not a voter's first choice, you want to be their second choice. And so as a voter, you're unlikely to give somebody their second choice vote because if all you hear them doing is bashing your candidate. So it discourages negative campaigning. And voters in ranked choice voting elections report less negative, less negative campaign. Um, finally, um, ranked choice voting um, reduces vote splitting. So if, in this case, the green and the purple candidates both have very similar political ideology, one of the discussions you will have is, oh, that political ideology is going to split the vote and allow somebody else to win. Ranked choice voting eliminates vote splitting. If you're a fan of the green candidate, vote for them first and put the purple second. If you're a fan of the purple candidate, vote for them first and put the green second. Ranked choice voting eliminates vote splitting. And that's one of the reasons why ranked choice voting results in the election of uh, more women and people of color than non-ranked choice voting elections. So, um, Let's talk about where ranked choice voting is, is used. Uh, ranked choice voting is used in 29 states across the country. That is comprised of 52 cities, two counties, and two states. In the most recent election cycle, more than 11 million voters participated in ranked choice voting elections. Um, if you notice, um, all of the states around Arizona utilize ranked choice voting uh, in some fashion. So um, I'll just highlight two of them. Um, Utah um, now uses ranked choice voting in 24 cities for their local elections. Uh, and in November, Nevada uh, will have a top five local primary and a ranked choice voting constitutional amendment on the ballot. So ranked choice voting is used in lots of places. It's been, been tested and demonstrated uh, to be successful. Um, finally, yeah, ranked choice voting uh, provides us elections that saves money, uh, that promotes positive campaigning, uh, it, it increases uh, diversity and inclusion um, in the folks who are represented, and, and most importantly, people like it. People report um, after they participated in a ranked choice voting election that they want to do it again, uh, that they liked it, they had. They use the options. In ranked choice voting, you're not required to vote for more than one candidate. You have the option to, and most people who participate in ranked choice voting elections do so. Um, and I'll turn it back over to Paul. All right. Um, with that, um, I believe that uh, we go to questions. So this is, uh, you all know this. Uh, right, um, that local elections are, are not partisan, right? Uh, and so that's one of the reasons why, uh, as the coalition um, that, that we are all part of, uh, we think the biggest leverage um, for these types of election reforms is not the nonpartisan elections. We think it's the partisan elections.
questions. So the state violations are legislative questions. And, and one of the reasons why we think that is because you all have, you all are great examples of how well nonpartisan elections work and the cooperative bridge building that, that those elections uh, bring. And so um, we want to leverage that experience and, and keep going. All right. Um, so let me talk just a little bit about our organization. Um, we have an organization that's called Safe Democracy. Um, our focus right now, we haven't selected uh, the right system, although uh, there are a lot of people who are very encouraged by what is taking place with the right choice voting. I can't tell you what we do believe. We believe that the existing partisan system is not working. The existing partisan system is not getting us the results that we want. We want to model it, but after something that is much closer to what happens at city government levels. Um, the, the system, again, that, uh, as Mike said, that council members have, you understand, it. you know that it works, but it does change the paradigm of thinking. It changes the paradigm of how people work. We're planning on continuing on our effort of gathering facts and information until we shift over to being a 501 uh, C4 and actually get into the campaigning portion, which will include an actual initiative that we grabbed. But today we're looking for people to join us and become a part of it uh, to look at. Uh, and how it is that we can change our system to make it more productive for the people. We believe a local government is the place where that effort should begin because we already know and understand the system. So, thank you for being here. With that, we'll take questions.